This is really surprising given that it's not even time for that uh, semi-annual foreign exchange policy report that the U.S. Treasury Department actually presents. Uh, back in May, they refrained from moving. So what changed? the past 24 hours. Uh, and in fact, I think there's three points that I would make on this. You, you mentioned what happened in May, and then take a look at the events of last week, where President Trump signaling that he was fully prepared to tack on additional tariffs to Chinese goods, about $300 million worth in additional tariffs. China responding at the end of last week with the comments of their own, uh, suggesting that they would have be forced to respond. Then you take a look at what they did to their currency earlier today. That provoked tweets from President Trump, in which he signaled earlier this morning that he said that they were manipulating their currency. China also having instructed their state-owned businesses to pull back in terms of some of the agricultural imports that they had made with regards to this. Uh, but this is without question uh, the, the, a red line from the administration's perspective that has been crossed. And so President Trump, for months, quite frankly, for years, having said that he would uh, assign this label of a currency manipulator to China, now appears that he has done that. Uh, and this is, without question, an escalation of the trade dispute between the U.S. and China. Yes, Kevin, uh, President Trump said he'd do it on day one, so uh, a tad late, but it has happened, and, and perhaps unsurprising in the current circumstances. Uh, but the president also said that uh, he'd like the Federal Reserve to counter the move. Uh, what hopes of that? What hope of intervention from the U.S.? Well, I think in terms of that front, you have to take a look about the rate decision, the rate cut decision that the central bank here uh, made last week in terms of uh, the president saying that he would have liked to have seen a more significant rate cut, but the central bank still having uh, issued that rate cut. And then you have the PBOC. I mean, from their, from Yi Gang's perspective, I mean, they having released some tough talk of their own against the United States. But I think in terms of a longer-term strategy, and this is a point that I would make in terms of uh, the, the reporting that I've gathered, not just from here in Washington, but also last week in Detroit at the Democratic presidential debate. Look, everyone has suggested that China is poised to, to, to play the long game and to outweigh the Trump administration, be it a four-year or an eight-year term. But quite frankly, the same populist rhetoric that exists in terms of the conservative movement and the Trump movement here in the United States, there is a parallel to be drawn in terms of progressive policies on the left by the likes of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. The bottom line, the point I'm trying to make here is that this exists on both sides. And so if you're trying to gauge this out into a longer term or to try to see when this ends, I'm not sure that there is a precise nor an accurate depiction for when this U.S. and China escalation ends. And I'm not sure, based upon my reporting, if I can say that it ends outside of a Trump White House. Kevin, what's really interesting when you go through the Treasury Department statement, we are seeing that they're actually relying on that act that I mentioned earlier in the show, the 1988 Omnibus Trade and Competitiveness Act. Uh, this, uh, the Treasury Department says, it requires the secretary to analyze the exchange rate policies of other countries. We had consistently talked to analysts saying that China does not qualify as a currency manipulator according to the 2015 Trade Act, but they could in the 1988 Act that is more subjective. Given this, uh, it's become very clear that this designation has become very politicized. And President Trump has also uh, hinted at the possibility that the U.S. might intervene as well. Has this latest action from China and also the U.S. raised those odds? Yes. Uh, wholeheartedly, yes. Uh, and in terms of the uh, in terms of the financial regulatory structure that you just alluded to between 1988 and, and, and you know, the second decade in 2000, I mean, that's the difference between a Bush White House and an Obama White House in terms of that legislation in particular. So how this is going to be applied uh, is going to be open for debate. And in terms of the response, and this is where the politics of this, I mean, to bring it home, I mean, this is a geopolitical issue, but here in the U.S., it is very much a domestic one. 
And President Trump does not have the full support of the Republican Party on his side when it comes to this. There are countless Republicans, some of the most staunchest allies to President Trump. Senator Lindsey Graham, for example, a Republican from South Carolina, Boeing country, has suggested that he would like the president to back off. There is legislation that exists in the, in the Republican-controlled Senate that would seek to rein in how the president negotiates on the issue of trade. The point I'm trying to make, Sherry, and you know this well, this is a divisive issue that cuts that, 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 that the ideological lines are so incredibly skewed. But without question, this is the most aggressive stance that President Trump has taken with regards to China uh, in, in, the, in his first term. Uh, and if anybody was hoping for there to be some type of major breakthrough in the summer, uh, well, by all accounts, this is not headed in that direction, and the president seemingly feeling emboldened as he is on the cusp of securing USMCA in the fall, uh, that he feels more emboldened to take an aggressive stance against the Chinese.